Who here has heard of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution before? Oh, good. Who here feels kind of quite familiar with it as a theory? Great. But don't worry if you didn't put your hand up, because I will try and explain what this theory is and why I think it's very relevant if you're somebody who wants to change the world today. Um, what I will start with, really, is just a quick overview of why it is that we talk about revolutionary theory uh, in, in, you know, in the first place, and why is it we should listen to theories that were developed by people like the Russian Revolution, really, on Trotsky. And I give two reasons. One is because we live in a world that is cre clearly crying out for revolutionary change on so many different levels, that the kind of crisis that we are experiencing, whether it's the ecological crisis, whether it's the crises that are caused by, by war, whether it's questions of oppression, the rise of the far right, or whether it's the grind of living under capitalism, we can see that the, for the vast majority of ordinary people, the world does not work. It works against their interests. And that at the core of what Trotsky was talking about, and as I'm going to explain, Trotsky was building on a much longer uh, term, an older tradition of revolutionary socialism, going back to ideas that he helped he develop from, from Marx um, and Engels, that the idea that you could change that system fundamentally um, by simply changing the political system, by perhaps making it more democratic, was something that Trotsky and Marx argued was not sufficient. That you actually had to root out capitalism, you had to get rid of the causes of that inequality, that oppression, the exploitation that drives, that dri drives the system. So as I said, what I'm going to do in this talk is try and situate how Trotsky thought about revolution and the way in which he theorized in particular the role of revolution in Russia, which was at that point when you know, he was theorizing this in the early 20th century. Uh, Russia was a country that had only fairly, it was a late developing capitalist country. It wasn't one of the countries that had pioneered capitalism as a, as a, social, as a social formation. Um, and I'm going to link that back to the older revolutionary tradition, uh, tradition of, Mar uh, of Marx and Engels. But then I'm also going to look at how Trotsky tried to put these ideas into practice in his, in his life and to think about permanent revolution as a theory, not only as a theory, but also as a practice. And one that was very much not simply uh, a theory, a kind of sociological explanation of how the world was, but one that was a guide to, a, a guide to action. And I'm also going to talk a bit about how Trotsky's thoughts about permanent revolution are complemented by positions and arguments that Lenin put forward, and particularly look at the role of Trotsky and Lenin in the Russian Revolution in 1917. And then finally, I'm going to talk a bit about permanent revolution today, and ask if the questions that Leon Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin asked themselves, and you know, together they asked the movement, and they built organizations that tried to ask these questions of society, whether those questions still hold, and what we should do as a consequence, and whether the kinds of, of problems that permanent revolution was, was designed to address are still ones that we, fa we face in the world today. So first I want to give a sketch now of, I think, one of the building blocks of how Trotsky understood revolution, the both the necessity for revolution and the possibilities of, of revolution. And this is rooted in his concept of um, what he called un uneven and combined development, and its role in creating the possibilities for a revolution that would burst <coughs> the boundaries of political change and become a social and become a social revolution. If you are unlucky enough to work in, in academia like I do, um, or a student, you may have come across versions of theories of uneven and combined development in an academic sense. So I just want to emphasise here. Um, but, you know, although some of, some of the people who write in that vein write things that are interesting, it's, that, that was, Tr Trotsky was never about producing an academic and reproducing an academic theory. And that uneven and combined development disassociated from permanent revolution, disassociated in particular from the attempt to build revolutionary parties and the attempt to build organisation that changes the world, 
has really no relationship with, 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 Trots with Trotsky's theories, and it is, in a sense, really shorn of its, uh, of its real explanatory, uh, of explanatory power. So what were the key insights that Trotsky um, was trying to develop under this banner or this label of, uh, of uneven and, and, and combined development? Essentially, what he was trying to do, I think, was to uh, theorize how capitalism as a system interacts with the constraints of space and time. Marx and Engels, in the Communist Manifesto, had already noted how dynamic the bourgeoisie capitalist class, as it emerged, was as a class. They described it as restless, as trying to scour the whole world for new opportunities, of pushing capitalism's boundaries out as fast as, as, fast as possible. It's kind of restless energy as a, as a, very, dynamic, a very dynamic force. And this is an important point because... Despite that restless energy, it also recognised that capitalism emerged somewhere and in a, in a particular place and time, not simultaneously everywhere. Um, if you think about that time lag, that countries where, and this is particularly relevant at the time that um, Marx and Marx and Engels were, were starting to first develop their theories, that time lag was expressed in the earliest capitalist countries, which can include, include the Netherlands, but also particularly Britain, um, using the fact that they had developed capitalism before everywhere else to turn that into a vector of conquest. The point when um, Marx and Engels were, were starting to write about uh, uh, beginning to develop um, their, their, their theories, the, the British Empire was... Uh, you know, was, the, was the predominant power in the, uh, in the globe, and it was conquering um, large swathes of, uh, 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 of, of the world, bringing them under the subjugation of um, uh, 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 not only of, of Britain in a military sense, but propagating capitalism as a system as it went. I mean, obviously, this is a process that, um, that, that, that took time, but there are all sorts of examples of, you think about how colonialism unfolded, where you know, the technological advances that capitalist powers had, the fact they had the Gatling gun, the steamship, uh, 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 and so on, were, uh, allowed, uh, allowed the um, more advanced forms of economic development to conquer whole societies and divide, and, and divide, and divide them up. So that radical hierarchy that emerged, though that unevenness that emerged, is partly a, pro a product of the fact that capitalism develops in first somewhere and then, sp and then spreads. And that actually, even after capitalism has conquered the entire planet, you still have the internal kind of logic of development of capitalism it means that changes in the way that capitalism works, again, propagate out from, uh, uh, from not, they don't emerge everywhere at once. And the advantages that are conferred by new ways of organizing capitalist production um, accrue in, in, in some places rather than others. So time is, is one of the things that Trotsky was, was looking at in his theory. He looked at the fact that Russia developed capitalism after Britain. And not only did Russia develop capitalism after Britain, it developed it in, in a slightly different way to how it developed in, in Britain. It, in the case of Russia, the, for example, the form of factory production tended to be concentrated in very, very large factories. It didn't go through a phase of, of many smaller factories or um, small workshops, but went straight in... Um, uh, particularly in the bits of the, of the Russian economy that were most important to the state, um, such as the large steel works and iron works, um, the weapons factories, uh, and so on, such as the uh, uh, Putilov works in St. Petersburg, that these concentrated tens of thousands of workers. So he does a very famous comparison, for example, between the scale of capitalist enterprise in Russia, which in many ways is, a, is an enormously backward country um, economically at the time he was writing, and um, with, uh, with Britain and America, and found that there were larger, in, 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 in general, larger factories, or the average um, uh, in, uh, of size of factory was larger, in, was larger in Russia. But nevertheless, this was also in the context of enormous contradictions. So you, had that the, you had these islands of very, um, very intense and concentrated and advanced capitalist production, um, which had restructured the whole of the, the whole of Russian Russian society, 
in a sea of peasantry and agricultural, um, uh, agricultural production, which had only just emerged from, from serfdom, had only just emerged really from uh, much older forms of from feudalism, from much older forms of, uh, 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 of, of production. And that contrast, that clash between the very advanced and the very backward created what he called an unstable amalgam of social forms and, the pos and explosive possibilities for, uh, for, 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 for revolution. Some of this, of course, is not only about time. Some of this is also about uh, how not all spaces are alike, not all natural, uh, the, the natural resources of the planet are not all evenly distributed. The coastlines bend in different ways, that the possibility of mountain chains a a appear, mineral deposits, oil deposits, and so on, or possibilities of growing particular types of crops, again, not evenly distributed across the, across the planet's, planet's surface. And again, this creates other kinds of, uh, uh, of unevennesses. There's a third um, set of processes in capitalism, which also, I think, tend to, towards this um, propensity to reproduce uneven and um, uh, uneven and, co and combined development, which is tendencies towards centralisation and concentration of capital, where actually there is an advantage that uh, that, the, that accrues to the co to the companies that can grow to a certain size. There's a tendency for that to allow you to invest more in, uh, in, in for example, in, in labour-saving machinery. Um, but there are advantages in terms of uh, clustering together under the protection of a state that can defend your interests in, in war. And I mentioned one of, again, the key insights in Trotsky's analysis of, uh, of Russia um, in the early 20th century was the role that the state had played in hothousing that development, that the state had incubated capitalism in, uh, in this very uh, uneven and distorted form. And I want to say something really briefly about this question of not just unevenness but combination, because combined development, Trotsky was talking about where you get combinations between, for example, the social and maybe um, cultural forms associated with earlier areas, earlier modes of production um, that still persist into an, era of, into an era of capitalism. In the case of Russia, again, some of the institutions of the monarchy um, hangovers from pre-capitalist era, the kind of the, the overweening role, role of, the, of the Russian Orthodox Church um, in, inside, the Russian, inside the Russian state. And in particular, the kind of truncated and very um, squeezed place that there was in this, so in the, in the kind of capitalism that grew up in Russia for the capitalist class itself, for the bourgeoisie. That in fact, the bourgeoisie in Russia in the early 20th century was not the kind of political actor that was going to lead a revolution like the French bourgeoisie had led, or even the, you know, the, the, the English one, and we had our um, somewhat truncated revolution uh, 350 years uh, ago in the, um, uh, against, um, uh, against, the, uh, against the monarchy. But certainly the idea that, that this, this form of capitalism that was emerging in, in, in Russia was going to produce um, political expressions of a capitalist class that would take on the old ruling class, the class that was in charge of the state, Trotsky argued that the, the social base was not, was not there for that in the same way, that the, that the bourgeoisie that had grown up was in the shadow of um, a state that dominated it, of the old ruling class that continued to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 dominate, to dominate the state. And this was an expression, if you like, of, the, of, again, a set of explosive contradictions, which led him to then the revolutionary conclusion that <coughs> instead of the bourgeoisie leading the transformation of Russia into a fully capitalist society with a capitalist state and capitalist democracy, um, that the liberal part of the, of the kind of capitalist project would be you know, enacted as it had been in, in other countries in, in other countries in Europe. He argued that instead, the leading role in transforming Russian society would be um, come from the working class. And this really was the most important insight that came out of um, uh, 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 of his theory. In this, and I, uh, he moved, he built on. Um, thank you. He built on the earlier conceptions of permanent of permanent revolution. 
in um, uh, that, that Marx, who had coined the term, Marx and Engels had coined the term in, um, in 1850. They wrote a letter in the wake of the, actually in the defeat of the 1848-1849 revolutions to the members of the small, um, uh, of the small revolutionary organisation that they were part of, where they had argued for what they called a, per a policy of permanent revolution. Trotsky um, referred to this, this letter and, t and talked about what he took from Marx and Engels' arguments, which is that he said that permanent revolution, in the sense which Marx attached to this concept, means a revolution which makes no compromise with any single form of class rule, which does not stop at the democratic stage, um, which goes over to, the so to socialist measures and towards war against reaction uh, from without. It's a revolution whose every successive stage is rooted in the preceding one and which can end only in complete liquidation, by which he meant that there was a process which didn't compartmentalise revolution into political change, the, ins the, begin the begin bringing into power of the bourgeoisie and the creation of a, of a, of a democratic republic, but actually saw that the working class had, an in had the, the interests of the working class were served by continuing that revolution, by making it permanent. And the key thing that Marx drew out of this, which I'll come back to in a, um, uh, in, in a, f in a few minutes, was the necessity for independent organization of the working class, that the working class could not rely on even radical Democrats from other classes, even though they might sound like they would have a lot in common, their arguments against, for example, the old, uh, uh, old pre-capitalist ruling classes or the higher levels of the bourgeoisie and so on, that the working class had to organise by, by and for itself. So that's a kind of sketch, if you like, of how Trotsky's theory of um, how Russian society had developed then was related to um, questions of, of begins to relate to questions of revolutionary organisation. And I want to talk now very briefly about Trotsky's own practice in this area, and in particular, the importance uh, um, of the experience that he had uh, with the, the Petrograd Soviet. Um, the, the Soviet as, was a form of organization that was discovered not actually by revolutionaries, but by the working class, in, by uh, organizers and activists in the, uh, in the Russian working class, who, in order to di direct their own struggles during the 1905 revolution, which was an abortive revolution against the, um, against the Tsarist state, created a, uh, a, a council of delegates from different striking workplaces, essentially, in order to lead and organize um, the, the general strikes that gripped the city and essentially ran the city as a kind of alternative government um, at the height of the revolutionary crisis. Trotsky was elected as the president of the Petrograd, of the Petrograd Soviet. This in itself was, a, was an enormous um, testament to the way in which the, 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 so the Soviet had upended some of the oppressive ideas in Russian society. Trotsky was Jewish and Russia was a society steeped in anti-Semitism where anti-Semitism was part of the way in which the state in particular used to divide and weaken, and weaken the working class. So for workers in, in Petrograd to elect Trotsky as a Jewish activist to, uh, to the leadership of this body showed how much people's ideas had shifted in struggle. And Trotsky's experience in, the, um, uh, in, relation, to the, in relation to the Petrograd Soviet was extremely, was extremely important and, and is, is the formative um, you know, kind of, it's a formative phase of his of his theorization of permanent revolution, which comes in the wake of the defeat of the of the 1905 revolution. But I want to argue um, now that, and, and I'm going to just say a few a, a few more words on this before I try and draw in a little bit to talk about um, permanent revolution today. I want to argue that the experience that um, Trotsky brought to this question, his the, the two, if you like, the, the kind of key components of his understanding of the way that, that Russian society worked, the revolutionary possibilities there, and his recognition of the, of the Workers' Council form of the Soviet as uh, a key mechanism for that um, to, uh, uh, to, to be achieved. 
would not have had the historical impact that it could have done without it being complemented by a set of theoretical and practical work done by, um, by Vladimir Lenin. Um, I won't go into the whole kind of ins and outs of the relationships between different, the different factions in the Russian Social Democratic and Labour Party, which uh, split into, into two factions in, um, uh, 19, in, in, in 1904. Lenin ended up, uh, was the leader of the Bolshevik faction, as people will probably, will, will probably know. The point here really is that Lenin was spent many years building a party, building a revolutionary party. Trotsky ended up kind of isolated from a revolutionary party until 1917, when both of them uh, worked together to integrate insights that they had had into the leadership of, um, uh, uh, of, the, of, the, of the revolutionary movement in, in, in Russia. And in particular, both played enormously important roles in the um, October Revolution. And the attempt to put into practice the logical outcomes of, uh, uh, of Trotsky's theory of, of, of permanent revolution. So what was Lenin's contribution in this specifically? I think that the, the moment when permanent revolution as an idea, this idea that you should have a revolution that doesn't stop, that you should have a, you could have a, a, a process that comes, um, that, that leaps over the bounds of democratic revolution and moves towards a socialist revolution, even in Russia, that was a relatively um, late developing uh, capitalist country. The moment when that really becomes um, clear is when Lenin arrives at Finland Station in April 1917, gets off the train and, are, uh, and, and puts forward the slogan, peace, bread, land, all power to the Soviets. So he picked up and turned into a concrete slogan, the insight also that Trotsky had had, that the, the Soviet, the Workers' Council form, was something more than just a temporary strike committee, that it could be the basis of uh, a, new, a, new social, a new social order. This, the April, so-called April thesis that Lenin, um, that, Lenin, the, uh, that, that Lenin then elaborated in a series of, uh, of articles, come at the same time as, some, as very important work um, writing by Lenin on the concept of dual power, where again he elaborates on this idea that the, so that the Soviet was, again, was not simply an organization for struggle, but it was something that could become the building blocks of a new, a new, form, of the, a new form of the state. And he goes on to elaborate again further on this in his writing on, uh, which would become the book State and Revolution, um, which he uh, would eventually publish actually after the October Revolution. One of the key points that he outlines in State, in, in state and Revolution is, is looking at what the state is. It's an organized, organized machinery of violence in society. It is, it is organized to perpetuate the, role, the rule of the bourgeoisie. And it's not something that can be simply inhabited by socialists by the left and changed from within. It has to be smashed and it has to be replaced by something else, and this was the point about the, the, the Soviet, that the Soviet could become the building blocks of a new, not just a new state, but a kind of anti-state, a state that would pave the way towards uh, a socialist society. I've now officially got two minutes left, so I'm hoping that I could beg the chair's intelligence to have a little bit more, a little bit more time on this question, because um, I, uh, so that I can talk sort of in fi five or six minutes about what's the significance of this for today. Um, so I hope that kind of very brief overview of some of the key, the key concepts in permanent revolution and its link to revolutionary practice should give you a sense of why this might be important. But I want to just argue through a few, a few things that I think are, 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 very, are very important to emphasize. Firstly, the, when we think about revolutions today, um, I would argue that the experience of revolutions in the, in the modern world does throw up very similar questions to the ones that Lenin and Trotsky were, 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 were confronting. The, the terrain on which the process of permanent revolution unfolds is still shaped by uneven and combined development. One important caveat here is that I would argue that you are now really talking about combination between different ways that capitalism is organized rather than between different modes of production. 
I mean, this has been used by some people to argue that the era of permanent revolution is finished because capitalism has won, essentially, I mean, until we defeat it. But capitalism, there are, there are no, there's no corner of the globe which is, non, which is really non-capitalist. But I would argue that the, the degree of contradiction that we can see between different phases of capitalist development is perfectly sufficient. And in fact, that this will actually intensify, um, particularly in an age of climate catastrophe, which has the, the possibilities, very imminent possibilities of throwing people, throwing us back to much earlier levels of development. Or you think about the destruction that's reaped in terms of, you know, in terms of, um, of the barbarism of war. Again, that kind of possibilities of explosive contradictions uh, is very much there within, <coughs> within capitalism. And the, the other part of the question relating to Trotsky and Lenin's experience of revolutionary organization, does that still, still hold up? Do revolutionary crises still form, um, produce forms of, throw up the possibility of producing forms of organization that start to take on similar characteristic to workers' councils? Well, I'd argue that actually they, they do. And in fact, if you look at, again, very large number of revolutionary crises, um, you know, you could pick, I could pick many, pick many, the crisis in Hungary in 1956, Portuguese revolution, um, the crisis, revolutionary crisis in Chile in, uh, uh, in, in, 19, in 1972, the Iranian revolution, the various phases of the, of the, uh, of the mass struggles in, in, in Bolivia, revolutions in, in, in Egypt and Syria uh, in 20, 2011, 2012, or the Sudanese revolution um, in 2018 to 2023, threw up forms of, revo forms of revolutionary organization, which while none of them really reached the same, exactly the same pattern as the Petrograd Soviet, clearly also had a relationship to the, uh, to, were, were part of the same family of, organi uh, 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 of organizations. I want to say just briefly a little bit about some of those limitations, though, because they're important. In some of these cases, you're talking about forms of organization that were revolutionary organization rooted in workplaces, um, like, the, like the workers' councils of the, Russian, of the Russian Revolution. In many cases, they didn't cross between workplaces and were, were worked within a single workplace. They were more like workplace councils rather than workers' councils. But, for example, in the Iranian Revolution, um, you had shuras, which were workplace-based councils, which took over the oil industry. And in fact, you know, at the height of the Iranian Revolution, the oil industry of Iran was run by the Iranian oil workers. Democratically elected, they controlled what was produced, where it went, where it was exported. And you know, this is, they had enormous power as a, a, as a result. In some cases, you have forms of revolutionary organization which you know, in, encroach into that space of, um, uh, of revolutionary organization, but are not based in the workplaces, are much more based on neighborhood committees. The Sudanese uh, resistance committees are a bit like this. They have some links to the workplaces, but are largely geographical. They, um, the degree to which you have mobilization and confrontation with the state um, helps to reveal the revolutionary potential of these organizations much, uh, much more, and they much more come into focus as organizations that start to take on characteristics of what Lenin called the powers of the Paris Commune type. They start to actually act in the space of being alternate, alternative forms of government, workers' government. Um, an, example of, uh, an, an, an example of this is if you think about um, if you, th if, you, if you think about the way in which a strike committee, in, if you have a general strike over, over, over a city, that if the, the more total the general strike is, the more that the people who are running the strike have to make actually quite life and death decisions about what goes on in the city. You know, is the electricity going to be turned off for the hospital because the electricity workers are on strike? You know, how will people get bread to eat? Will you turn off the, you know, turn off uh, supplies of gas or water to people's to, to people's homes? And the more that those decisions are made on a democratic basis and on a basis of need, then the more you've encroached into um, uh, it, 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 into decisions that are really in the in the space of government. Um, I was going to show you I was going to show you a diagram, but I think I'll leave it. I'll, I'll can show people later. I can show people later who are interested because I have a theorisation about 
permanent revolution as a process that develops along a number of different axes. But I want to make sure we have time for, time for discussion, so I'll bring that up if, if people want to go into a bit more detail. The final point, and I promise the chair I'll finish here, um, is that at the heart of all this is a question about revolutionary organisation. Because talked, I've talked a bit about the way in which uneven and combined development still throws up forms of broad revolutionary organisations in the broad sense. But the thing that was, to go back to this conversation, this, this dialogue between Lenin and Trotsky, if you like, the thing that has been missing in the, all of the examples that I've, I've talked about since 1917 has been a revolutionary party that is a party of permanent revolution. That was what Lenin managed to convince the Bolshevik party to become, although they actually all thought he was completely off his rocker when he stepped off the train in Finland station. And it took a very long, hard argument and a lot of, fal and a lot of false starts and near disaster uh, in order to persuade people that it was the right, the, the right, the right thing to do. Um, but if you don't have a revolutionary party that's willing to fight for that vision of... Um, a revolution that doesn't stop, of a revolution that gets to the heart of where, what is the roots of oppression and exploitation, then actually the thing starts to unravel. It's the, the revolutionary party is essential at the core, it's the kind of fulcrum around which the questions of permanent revolution turn. And I'm sure you can guess where the punchline is coming on this. If you're not in one, please join one and we need you to make the revolution work.